Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos ao Museu da Manhã. Primeiramente, obrigado. É uma alegria, uma honra para o Museu da Manhã receber esse momento, nessa, nessa tarde. É, o professor Thomas Lovejoy, que vai nos falar sobre biodiversidade brasileira, um dos grandes estudiosos mundiais sobre biodiversidade, um evento em colaboração com a Academia Brasileira de Ciências, o que para nós é uma grande honra. E eu gostaria de é, recordar e reconhecer é, que estamos no território de nossos ancestrais, aqueles brasileiros antes do Brasil, cariocas antes do Rio, mauaenses antes da Praça Mauá, nossos ancestrais Tupinambás, Tupiniquins, Temiminós e Tamoios. Estão aqui conosco neste lugar. E a biodiversidade, nossos consultores, os consultores que nos ajudaram a construir a narrativa, o conceito do Museu da Manhã, identificaram a alteração da biodiversidade como uma das grandes tendências que vão moldar o amanhã nas próximas décadas. É no âmbito dessas tendências que escolhas terão que ser feitas. E essas escolhas que nós tomarmos hoje vão favorecer este ou aquele cenário de amanhã possível. Dependendo das escolhas que nós fizermos, certos cenários são favorecidos. Outras escolhas vão levar a outros resultados. Então é absolutamente essencial que, através do conhecimento acumulado pela ciência, nós possamos fazer boas escolhas, escolhas bem fundamentadas, escolhas que nos permitam pavimentar o caminho para amanhãs favoráveis, para amanhãs de integração, de inclusão, de alegria e prosperidade. Queria, então, agradecer a presença de todos, é, lembrar que tem que desligar os celulares e queria, então, chamar o, o, o presidente da Academia Brasileira de Ciências, o professor físico Luiz Davidovich, por favor. Bom dia, é um grande prazer, uma emoção estar aqui. É, eu queria agradecer o Museu do Amanhã por essa parceria que, que tem já sido comprovada em outras ocasiões e que eu espero se fortaleça cada vez mais, porque é uma identidade óbvia entre as duas instituições. Né? Esse é o Museu do Amanhã e o que a Academia Brasileira de Ciências faz também é, é sempre estar voltada para o futuro, as propostas da academia visam o futuro do país. Né? Então, é uma identidade natural entre as duas instituições. E eu sou muito grato por, esse, por essa parceria. É, não haveria momento mais adequado para termos uma palestra e uma presença tão honrosa como a que temos hoje, do professor Thomas Lovejoy. A Amazônia é um grande tesouro nacional. A Amazônia é legal, pega 59% do território nacional. É um tesouro fantástico que nós temos que tomar cuidado para não desperdiçar. É um tesouro que deve ser estudado. A solução para a Amazônia está intimamente ligada à ciência, à inovação tecnológica sustentável, que não destrua a floresta. A exploração da biodiversidade através de uma biotecnologia baseada nela é uma solução para a preservação da floresta. E é com tristeza que nós vemos hoje em dia essa floresta ser objeto de moeda de troca política, né? ou ser objeto de desejo do governo de usar parte dessa floresta para reduzir a dívida. Isso é o contrário do que nós propomos. Vai na contramão do futuro do Brasil, porque a Amazônia tem que ser tratada com muito cuidado. A alternativa entre explorar a biodiversidade ou fazer uma mineração tem que ser estudada com cuidado, de modo a balancear essas maneiras de, de, de tratar a floresta. E não é o que nós estamos vendo no momento. Então, é, é, é muito oportuno ter essa atividade hoje. Essa atividade continuará amanhã e depois na Caribe Brasileira de Ciências com um, uma oficina de trabalho sobre a biodiversidade. E eu quero dizer para vocês que a Academia Brasileira de Ciências tem proposto em todos os níveis de governo, de parlamento, a, a biodiversidade como uma plataforma para o futuro do Brasil, como um elemento essencial a preservação e a utilização da biodiversidade de forma sustentável como fazendo uma parte essencial de uma agenda de futuro para o Brasil. Eu costumo dizer que, assim como nos Estados Unidos houve o um homem na Lua, né, depois do Sputnik, a reação dos americanos mudando a educação, mudando a indústria, aqui o nosso homem na Lua 
é a Amazônia, são os biomas nacionais, é a exploração sustentável da biodiversidade. Eu sou muito grato ao professor Thomas Lovejoy por sua presença aqui hoje. Eu acho que nós vamos aprender muito com ele e é realmente uma palestra muito significativa nos dias de hoje. Agradeço a presença de vocês, paro por aqui, porque todos nós queremos escutar o professor Thomas Lovejoy. Passo a palavra ao Alberto Val, do, do Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Amazônicas, membro da Academia Brasileira de Ciências, que juntamente com o Vivaldo é, ajudou a organizar essa reunião e também a reunião de amanhã. E, e o Adalberto Val, também amigo do, do Thomas Lovejoy, vai apresentar então o nosso conferencista e falar também sobre essa sequência de eventos né, que começa hoje com essa grande palestra. Muito obrigado. Boa tarde a todos, boa tarde a todas. É, é um prazer imenso é, ver é, o nosso trabalho se concretizando aqui neste momento. Agradeço muito a parceria com o professor Vivaldo, mas também é, a Gabriela, que nos ajudou muito na organização é, deste evento. Este é um evento preparatório para uma reunião maior que deverá acontecer em Manaus no ano que vem, em 2018, entre pesquisadores da Amazônia, não só brasileira, com pesquisadores franceses. A partir do conjunto de observações e das discussões que nós teremos, a partir de agora e também amanhã e depois, lá na Academia Brasileira de Ciências, nós vamos construir a agenda para esta reunião é, do, ano, do ano que vem. Nos próximos dias, nós vamos ter uma primeira reunião com o pessoal da França para discutir o formato desta reunião e como é que a gente vai avançar, é, avançar com a organização. É, portanto, eu quero desde já deixar um convite a todos vocês para essa é, sequência de eventos que nós vamos ter amanhã e depois na Academia Brasileira de Ciências, mas também para o ano que vem, 2018, esta discussão que teremos é, com é, os colegas franceses. É, esta, esta sessão de abertura, que será proferida pelo professor Thomas Lovejoy, como já foi mencionado, ela está sendo transmitida também para a Columbia University em, uh, em Nova York e também para sete outros pontos uh, em países amazônicos, tá certo? Por, uh, exatamente por dentro, uh, fazendo uma conexão com o Amazon Day que está acontecendo nesse período lá em, uh, em Nova York, como parte das atividades da SDSN Amazônia, que é um capítulo da uh, Organização das Nações das Nações Unidas. E é muito importante que eu também fatize mais uma vez que esta uh, sessão de abertura é uma sessão que foi organizada em conjunto da Academia Brasileira de Ciências e o Museu do Amanhã. E é muito importante que a gente uh, uh, dê força para esta relação uh, entre a Academia e o Museu do Amanhã de tal forma a uh, valorizar as atividades de ciência e tecnologia e a importância da sua socialização neste momento em que vivemos eh, situações, cenários extremamente difíceis eh, para a ciência e tecnologia no país. Eh, o nosso eh, conferencista desta tarde, que vai nos brindar eh, com a palestra eh, já indicada aqui, tá certo? o futuro da biodiversidade eh, brasileira, é o professor Tom Lovejoy. Para aqueles que militam eh, na área de biodiversidade, de biologia, eh, de Amazônia, o professor Tom Lovejoy dispensa apresentações. Mas gostaria de lembrar só algumas características, por conta fundamentalmente dos jovens que estão aqui presentes eh, nesse momento, o que valoriza por demais este evento que trata, na realidade, da biodiversidade, que é o capital do futuro, capital para o futuro desse, desse país. 
O professor Lovejoy terminou seu doutorado em 1960 e ele trabalhou basicamente nos arredores de Belém do Pará, essencialmente com a observação de pássaros. Ele é, na realidade, o primeiro indivíduo a ter a licença do CEMAV para trabalhar com essas, com essa, nessa área. Ele começou o projeto dos fragmentos florestais, a dinâmica biológica de fragmentos florestais, em 1979, eh, através de uma cooperação entre o INPA, o Instituto Nacional de Pesquisa da Amazônia, e o, e o Smithsonian. Atualmente, há 85 pessoas trabalhando eh, na, eh, na reserva eh, lá em Manaus. O professor Lovejoy tem um impressionante é, currículo vitae, eu não vou listar tudo aqui, porque gastaríamos todo o tempo aqui, mas eu posso dizer para vocês um único número, ele é autor de 720 publicações sobre diversidade biológica, biodiversidade e os aspectos relacionados a ela. Dono de vários, uh, de vários uh, uh, prêmios, como o Tyler Price, em 2001, Uh, Woward uh, in Ecology and Conservation Biology da uh, BBVA em 2009, o Blue Planet Prize em 2012 e participou das 25 edições do curso de ecologia e uh, curso de campo de ecologia e floresta amazônica em Manaus. Uh, a última edição desse programa terminou recentemente. Portanto, Uh, desejo a vocês todos uh, que apreciem a palestra do professor Tom Lovejoy. Todos presentes, distinguidos presentes, uh... Adalberto, muito obrigado pela uh, introdução. Uh, é uma grande honra de ter esse convite aqui na Academia Brasileira de Ciência. Uh, and I'm going to give it in English because I'm better at that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, am, I am not going to Uh, focus as I often do on the importance of uh, of the Im importance of biological diversity as a fundamental library for the life sciences. Uh, it is, in fact, you know, each species is a set of solutions to a set of biological problems, and any one of those can turn out at any time to revolutionize our understanding of the life sciences. Uh, there is so much more complex than virtually anything that humans have created. Uh, Ed Wilson once calculated that the amount of information in a single chromosome of a mouse, a domestic mouse, is equal to all the information as a computer would count it and all editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica combined. Uh, So I think it's just really important for us always to remember, remember that there is this incredible library there, uh, mostly so far unread by science. And I'm also not going to dwell on the problems of science and environment in my own country or yours. Uh, I want to talk about biodiversity in general and conservation uh, in Brazil. And I'm going to begin with the very first lesson uh, that I ever learned about biodiversity in Brazil in 1965, uh, when I learned that latitudinal gradients of diversity don't apply the same to all kinds of organisms. That in fact, there is only one bumblebee in the lowland Amazon. And that was taught to me by Braulio Diaz's father, Domiciano, uh, who actually showed me a real nest of one of these things in the forest floor, uh, a memory I still find very vivid today 
uh, many years later. So one of the aspects of biodiversity is, you know, constant discovery of new forms of life. And this is one of the more interesting birds uh, discovered in the Amazon uh, just in the last few years. Uh, this is a family of birds which is not known actually to be very present at all in the lowland Amazon. And it's named in this case for Jürgen Hoffer, uh, an ornithologist and petroleum geologist who's famous for looking at the distribution patterns of bird species in the Amazon and putting forward a thesis uh, that in essentially glacial periods, uh, there were refugia in the Amazon in which new species evolved. Uh, I don't think that theory is, is very much accepted these days, uh, but the patterns that he discovered are very real, and so that remains an elusive problem uh, to be solved. So it turns out the reason nobody had ever seen this jay was because it only occurs uh, in little bits of campina, essentially grasslands, uh, which occur in little isolated spots in the middle of the Amazon forest. And it was only when uh, uh, Mario Kohnhoff decided to actually go and see what lived in those campinas uh, that he uncovered the fact that, in fact, there is a healthy population of jays uh, in these habitats. But one of the points I want to make here is that here in Brazil, as anywhere in the world, one of the huge unknowns, one of the great frontiers, is soil biodiversity. Uh, and it's incredibly important because it relates a lot to uh, soil fertility, how soil fertility is created. Uh, and there is a, an effort nowhere near as, as large as it needs to be, and Brazil is part of it, to actually uh, create uh, much more knowledge about soil biodiversity. And there is, oh, I don't know, there's something disappeared, but anyway, try the next one. Here it is, this went too fast. There is a global atlas of soil biodiversity, uh, which uh, you can actually just access online and download for free. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about soil biodiversity, uh, that is a good first step. So here in Brazil, as in everywhere else in the world, freshwater biodiversity is pretty much neglected. And that's in part because most people in the world think of freshwater simply as a physical substance and actually don't understand that it's a habitat. And it is filled with all kinds of fascinating organisms, whether it's something like this Star Wars-like Volvox, uh, green algae, uh, which rolls around uh, in the, in the in freshwater environments, or some of the aquatic insects, like uh, caddisflies, uh, the larvae of which build absolutely exquisite uh, little essentially habitations in which they live and, and protect their soft uh, uh, bodies, uh, sometimes with grains of sand. Here's another one of them. And that's the front end. And sometimes they're made of leaves and sometimes of other things. Uh, and that's just scratching the surface here of what there is to be found uh, in freshwater biodiversity. And of course, we all think of freshwater biodiversity almost first and foremost as fish. Uh, and indeed, 
there are some incredible fish here in Brazil. Uh, the Amazon has more species of fish than any river in the world. And up the Rio Negro, there are many of the classic aquarium fish that uh, hobbyists actually keep around the world. Uh, this particular one is called the, the Cardinal Tetra. I remember it was discovered uh, when I was in high school. It's a very exciting moment. And then, of course, they're the really big fish, the big catfish of the Amazon. Uh, many species of them with incredible life cycles, uh, which virtually encompass the entire length of the river system, uh, from the estuary uh, to the headwaters and back. And that is actually a major issue in the design of uh, energy systems in the Amazon. I think there is a critical need to rethink the design, modernize the energy plans for the Amazon to actually allow the access for these fish to continue their migrations, uh, as well as to maintain the sediment flows, which are actually very important to the ecology uh, downstream. We also have, uh, thinking at the biome level, certain biomes that really don't get a lot of attention. And I would put the Katinga right at the top of the list. So that is, this is one of the few protected areas in the Katinga. Again, and this I think is an important way to think about uh, the conservation challenges and opportunities for biodiversity uh, in Brazil. Uh, first, by just looking at the amount of protection in particular biomes. It's a pretty coarse cut, uh, but you can really see that uh, there is serious uh, uh, underrepresentation uh, in the Caatinga. It's a little better in Cerrado uh, with all those incredible plants that live there. Uh, and so that's part of the challenge going forward. How do we actually increase the amount of protection uh, in neglected biomes in Brazil? So there was a program. I think it's probably pretty moribund now. I may be wrong on that, but my sense is it's pretty moribund. Uh, the ProBio program, which actually is designed to actually increase the amount of knowledge about biodiversity in less studied parts of Brazil. Uh, I think it really needs, you know, greater attention, greater funding uh, for when one can start to think that way. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, not every scientist is uh, sitting back and waiting for that program to happen. And IMPA had a really interesting opportunity uh, to fill in a blank. And it came from an analysis that Mario did looking at a lot of the high places around the Amazon and the rest of Brazil, which basically had never been visited by biologists. Uh, so those are all those possible areas. The one that Mario got to go to with the help of the Brazilian military was the Serra de Mocidade uh, about a year or so ago. Uh, it was quite an effort. Uh, I should be able to rattle off the numbers of things that uh, they, they uncovered in the process. Uh, I can't, but I can assure you it is impressive. Uh, and of course, it was an amazing place to get to, a logistic challenge, uh, only achievable uh, with support of military transport. Uh, there's the camp they created. And there it is at night. Uh, so a whole team of scientists uh, went up there in the course of that. Uh, so I think that's the kind of thing we need a lot more of going forward. Uh, and 
every time you turn around, new species are being discovered. So I'm going to go through about four or five uh, out of at least a couple hundred uh, that have turned up in the Amazon in recent years, uh, reported in a, uh, a recent publication of World Wildlife Fund Brazil. So a new species of monkey, the fire-tailed TD monkey, uh, a high-altitude tree frog, a tyrant flycatcher named for Chico Mendes, a new species of pink dolphin, and then there are plants. So I'm going to talk a little bit about plants uh, uh, and how they can play into exploring biodiversity here. Uh, and, you know, whether it's something everybody knows and loves in Brazil, like Guaraná, or the Urucu, which the Indians use as a dye and as a foodstuff. Uh, so many years ago, there was a major effort uh, called Projeto Flora, uh, endeavoring to explore the, the flora of the Amazon. Uh, it was a very significant achievement. Uh, but there are a whole series of things that can be done today uh, that could not be done then, uh, which apply to anywhere in Brazil, not just the Amazon. Uh, and that is virtually every type specimen of a plant. A type specimen is the specimen from which a species is first described. And they live, uh, if they're animals, they live in natural history museums. If they're plants, the specimens live in herbaria, uh, often in botanical gardens, as well as natural history museums. And virtually all the type specimens of plants in the world have now been scanned uh, electronically. So this makes it much, much easier for a botanist to actually get at that information and determine whether a plant that he or she may have uh, in his or her hand is actually something that's already been seen by science or whether it's something new. Uh, the Rio Botanic Garden has had all its type specimens scanned, for example, New York Botanical Garden, et cetera. So this is really an enormous step forward in enabling botanical science uh, in the exploration of diversity of plants. Uh, and then another interesting pair of studies was done, one at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian, and the other at the New York Botanical Garden, uh, both trying to figure out whether you could use botanical collections to actually get a shortcut to figuring out which species of plants uh, were likely to be endangered and needed conservation attention. Uh, you know, at, at first blush, that seems like almost an impossible thing to sort out, you know, in hundreds of thousands of plant specimens. Uh, but in fact, the, the first study looking at this uh, tried to do it for a place where plants were actually quite well known in terms of what was endangered or wasn't and what were not, uh, namely the plants of Puerto Rico. Uh, but ignoring what was known uh, on the ground in Puerto Rico, uh, the scientists went through the specimens uh, in the National Museum of Natural History and quickly rejected you know, anything that was there represented by hundreds of specimens. That clearly wasn't a candidate to be endangered or in need of conservation. And homed in on those for which there are only one or two specimens, uh, and those were really likely candidates. Now, not all of them turn out to be that, uh, but just that museum exercise alone came to a very close approximation 
of the endangered plant list, plant list for Puerto Rico. So it's not foolproof, but it takes so long for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature to actually go through the information to list a plant species as endangered. Uh, that a shortcut like this uh, can be very helpful. So now I inevitably turn to uh, what I think was one of the most important bits of environmental science done in the 20th century, uh, done uh, by my friend and colleague, Aeneas Salati. And most people are unaware that there was a time when everybody thought that vegetation was simply the consequence of climate and had absolutely no influence whatsoever on the climate. And Aeneas, by looking at ratios of isotopes of oxygen in the mid-1970s, was able to prove without a doubt that if you did that and you looked at those ratios from the Atlantic to the Peruvian border, the Amazon was clearly making half of its own rainfall. There was recycling going on as the air mass moved from the Atlantic to the Andes. Now, I really think this is one of the most important bits of environmental science of the 20th century uh, because it shattered that dogma, it shattered that paradigm. Uh, and it doesn't, in my view, still get sufficient recognition. And it, of course, carries very important implications for how the Amazon should be managed because it works as a system. And so it has to be managed as a, as a system. And you simply can't keep chewing away at the forest and expect that system to still work. So I think this is one of his famous statements about it at the time of the discovery. But the next image I'm going to show you is that this, this science has only gotten stronger with time. And so we now know not only does that hydrological cycle you know, recycle maybe five or six times as the air mass goes from the Atlantic to the Andes. It also sends a lot of moisture south of the Amazon, not only to southern Brazil, but also as far as the La Plata Basin. So this is the most recent, recent visualization I've seen of this based on real data. Uh, for a short period of time, but you can see the moisture goes an extraordinary distance, uh, which is why if Brazil really wants to achieve its agricultural ambitions uh, to be an agricultural world power, the only way you can do that is by actually conserving and managing the Amazon as a system. Otherwise, there will be insufficient rainfall. Uh, and agriculture will not be successful, uh, nor will a lot of biodiversity survive well uh, south of the Amazon. And there are indeed suggestions that the system is in a little shaky state. Uh, historic droughts in 2005 and 2010. And when we first started talking about this, uh, and Carlos Nobre uh, got a graduate student to actually do a model. Uh, the result was that probably you needed 30 to 40 percent of the Amazon to, uh, to uh, you were needed to avoid 30 to 40 percent deforestation, uh, so 60 to 70 percent intact. But that was before we also had the influence of climate change and before we understood the pervasive impact of widespread use of fire in the Amazon. So I personally believe that limit is around 20% uh, 
uh, and that I think is where we are pretty much today. And I think the bottom line of that is any new increment of deforestation has to be matched with an increment of reforestation. Uh, easy to state in principle, harder to do in practice, uh, but I think it's very real. Uh, and as we know, as roads get built, uh, spontaneous colonization spills uh, off in either direction, and you get the famous uh, fish spine uh, road systems developing. Uh, and basically, if that continues to happen, you get this kind of pattern, which happens everywhere in the world that humans occupy the landscape, which is as they clear the natural vegetation, you end up with a landscape which is filled with, with fragments, whether it be a forest or cerrado uh, or whatever vegetation it may be. So this is, you know, the state of Wisconsin, uh, but you could also sort of change the caption and it would apply as well to some parts of the Mata Atlantica, uh, which I have to remind you that Darwin, when he saw it, called it one great, wild, untidy hothouse made by nature for herself. Right? Uh, so fragmentation uh, is an issue with which I'm associated, of course, and it's partly because there was a big controversy in the early 1970s when I was starting to work for the World Wildlife Fund uh, as to what was better, one big protected area or a bunch of small ones that added up to the same size. Not a choice you'd get in the real world, but nonetheless, that was the controversy. And I realized uh, that if we didn't understand more about it, any of the projects that were going to the board of the World Wildlife Fund, we simply couldn't tell you whether they would work uh, in the long run. And so that led uh, to the joint IMPA Smithsonian project uh, on forest fragmentation, which is today in its 38th year. I plan to do it for 20 years, but of course, I had no idea about rates of change. Uh, and it, it took a good 15 years to get the simple answer to the question, which was big is really important. Uh, and we also soon realized that there was this unbelievably wonderful capacity building going on uh, and that this really should run in perpetuity. Uh, it's one of the few long-term data sets in the world Imagine having a world of global change with very few long-term data sets so you really understand what you're doing. Um, so I'm now committed to this, you know, going on in perpetuity uh, and taking various steps to make sure that's the case. Well, what do you do uh, if you have a fragmented landscape and you know perhaps the single result that makes the case here that a hundred hectare fragment of Amazon forest loses half of the forest interior bird species in less than 15 years. So this is one of those forest interior bird species. It's called a, a white plumed ant bird. It's an ant, army ant following bird and it simply does not like to go out into sunlight. So it's one of the species that drops out. Uh, so the question is, since in most of the world, we already have a fragmented landscape, what can we do about managing it so we don't lose all of that biodiversity that otherwise would just essentially run off, just like a radioactive mineral will lose radioactivity and de decay to a simpler state. So the good news here is it doesn't happen instantly so if you can do, as has been done here in the Mata Atlantica, uh, in which uh, Stuart Pym and Brazilian colleagues have literally been 
uh, stitching uh, isolated bits of forest back together uh, through forest re restoration. Uh, you can actually save a lot of those species before otherwise they go away. Uh, and so this is in the region of the Mico Leão, uh, which only had 100 individuals when I first started working for the World Wildlife Fund in 1973, uh, in a combination of really successful captive propagation programs and then pioneering reintroduction programs because the Mike Leões uh, really had to learn uh, how to, to forage in the wild and avoid predators in the rest. Uh, so they've been increasing in number and they've actually taken advantage of this little corridor that we saw before uh, to, sorry, to cross uh, into a new set of Mata Atlantica that they had not had access to before. So now I'm going to show you a number of bird species that benefit from this kind of stitching together of fragments. Uh, one of the hummingbirds, the black jacobin, a uh, yellowback tanager, a violet capped wood nymph, another hummingbird, a rufous tailed jacamar, a green headed tanager, a beautiful bird. Another hummingbird, a coquette, uh, and a crestnut chested barbette. So these are the kinds of species that get rescued by putting connections back into the landscape. And one of the things I want to just talk about for a few minutes is the value of riparian vegetation in conservation landscapes. Uh, as you know, the, the extent of riparian vegetation was reduced in the new forest code. Uh, I think actually that was a mistake uh, because riparian vegetation is not only important to avoid soil erosion, uh, not only important in terms of water quality of the water courses, it's also very important because it puts connection into landscapes that otherwise wouldn't be there. And that's important not only from the point of view of combating the fragmentation effects we've just been talking about, it's also very important in giving natural corridors for species to use when they're trying to track a changing climate. So now I want to talk a little bit about what climate change means to all of this. Uh, not particularly knowledgeable about the impacts here in Brazil, where the temperature effects are certainly quite uh, lower than they are uh, where I live or in the Arctic. Uh, but virtually almost every place anybody has looked, you can see the fingerprints of climate change. And some of it's manifested in basically change of timing of life cycles. Uh, so this is a whole bunch of plant species blooming earlier at the Royal Botanic Garden uh, at Kew outside of London. Um, more importantly, we are actually seeing species move, changing where they occur geographically. So this is one of the two best known butterfly species in North America, and it has clearly been moving northward and upward, uh, tracking its required climatic conditions. So if one is starting to have that kind of movement, and we're seeing it certainly on the slopes of the Andes, species of plants actually moving upslope, uh, having connections in the landscape uh, is really very important indeed. Uh, but we are also seeing, in at least two examples, uh, abrupt change in ecosystems. Uh, and one of those is in the coniferous forests of North America. Uh, and what basically is happening is the balance between the native bark beetles and the coniferous trees has been tipped in favor of the beetles. The, 
we're now going to see a sequence of bark beetle outbreaks in British Columbia over a period of about 25 years. Uh, and basically, you'll just see little pinpricks of red at the beginning, which get bigger with time. And what is happening is more beetles are overwintering, and they're getting an extra generation in the summer. And the consequence of all of this is basically uh, greater and greater impact on the trees. And even in 1985, when there was a really severe winter, it didn't knock the beetles back uh, as far as has been the case uh, before climate change. So basically what we're dealing with here uh, is a really major change in an ecosystem with perhaps in some places 70% of the trees are dead. There are no more live ponderosa pines in the Yosemite Valley, for example. Uh, and uh, so what we're having is an abrupt change that could not have been predicted from a climate model or a vegetation model because it really comes down to the idiosyncratic relationship between just a small number of species. And we're seeing the same thing happen in tropical coral reefs. Uh, and of course, I have to mention here the, that it's really exciting, this discovery of tropical coral reefs uh, at the mouth of the Amazon uh, in recent years, when somebody caught a fish that clearly was a reef fish, and then they went and looked. Uh, but tropical coral reefs are in serious trouble from climate change. Uh, and it, it involves the relationship between the coral animal and the alga that is at the heart of the coral reef ecosystem. And only a little bit of warm water, uh, not very warm and not very long, causes the, the coral animal to eject the alga. So what you have is this marvelous, diverse, technicolor world immediately goes into what's called a bleaching event. Essentially, it goes black and white, and the diversity crashes, the productivity crashes, the benefit to local communities crash. Uh, and so these two examples uh, I'm giving you because I think the climate negotiations uh, spent a very long time not thinking about climate impact on biodiversity. And they chose the two degree target uh, that was the target for so long, basically thinking that it might be a target that could be achieved, not that it had any intrinsic merit. So the really good news is that at the Paris uh, conference and the Paris Agreement, it actually refers to climate change less than two degrees and preferably around one and a half degrees. Uh, and that's, of course, not an easy challenge, uh, but biology and biodiversity have a really important contribution to make. Uh, so this is essentially the annual equation that's feeding climate change. Uh, basically, you know, a significant amount of carbon going up into the atmosphere from the destruction of modern day ecosystems, principally tropical forests, which are very carbon dense about five times as much going into the atmosphere from fossil fuels, which basically in the end are just ancient ecosystems, uh, the energy of which was trapped below ground. Uh, and about half of it goes into the atmosphere and the rest essentially divided equally between uh, land and the sea. So one of the questions is, can we manage that equation uh, to to get to a better outcome. Uh, reducing fossil fuel use is obviously the number one thing to do. Uh, but on top of this, uh, we're moving up globally uh, to something that seems really far away from here in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, but what's going on in the Arctic. And the Arctic regions actually get more heating 
uh, than any other part of the planet, mostly because there's more land in the northern hemisphere, but also because with the reduction of ice, there's less energy being reflected back to space and more of it being absorbed. Uh, so there's a real issue here uh, in the Arctic region, uh, which actually has something waiting to happen that should desperately be avoided. And there is an enormous amount of carbon in what is called the permafrost regions of the Arctic. Uh, quite extensive, and here you're gonna see some projections uh, with what is happening to Alaska uh, if we keep going the way we're going. So to give you another sense of the scale, uh, these are the major sources of uh, or pools of, of carbon at the moment. That's permafrost in the lower right, really big. Uh, it's essentially almost twice that in the atmosphere. Uh, that smaller amount in tropical forests. Uh, and that is the amount of accessible fossil fuels uh, that could toss CO2 in the atmosphere if they're all extracted and burned. Uh, obviously not a very good idea. So the, what I'm trying to do here is build a case for one and a half degrees. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually might get there, uh, as impossible as it might seem. So there are all kinds of reasons around ice uh, to avoid going to two degrees, trying to stick at one and a half. And in addition to that, as we've already seen, there's potential major ecosystem disruption. Uh, so ignoring ecosystems for a minute and thinking about that two degree target, you only need to know one thing, which is we know that the last time the planet was two degrees warmer, the oceans were four to six meters higher. And, you know, we'd be sloshing around here in the Museum of Tomorrow. Right? Uh, so obviously two degrees is a really ridiculous target, crazy ridiculous. Uh, and then the issue becomes, how could we actually, given current trends and everything else, how could we actually uh, engineer a soft landing at around one and a half degrees? And of course, the jury is out on that as to whether we succeed or not, but there's a really important piece of the puzzle that's really not being grasped by the policy world uh, very much at the moment. And that is, in a sense, almost a secret that there is a major amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from centuries of destruction of modern day ecosystems. And there's no reason a lot of that can't be brought back by ecosystem restoration. So that's, that's what I call my terminal quixotic dream, right? Uh, and the, the fascinating thing is we know that twice in the history of this planet, there were just amazingly high levels of CO2 brought down to pre-industrial levels by natural processes. The first was when plants first appeared on land, and the second was when modern flowering plants uh, appeared doing the whole thing even more efficiently. So we know that the planet is capable of taking care of it, but we also know that we don't have tens of millions of years to let it happen that way. And ecosystem restoration gives us the opportunity to do something about it uh, quite rapidly. So this is sort of a schematic uh, view of this. There's nothing about the numbers or a scale on that that means uh, anything 
uh, quite real, except for 350 being parts per million being the sort of the one and a half degree safe level. And today we're already at 400. Uh, so I've, I've done the calculations. Uh, what happens if we can essentially restore a lot of the de degraded ecosystems of the planet? And it's on the order of 0 0.4 to 0.5 degrees centigrade uh, of temperature increase that can be avoided. The good news being is you reach a level of CO2 concentration, but you don't instantly go to the equivalent temperature increase. There's a lag time there. So if you pull it down, you can avoid some of that warming. So obviously I'm talking here about about reforestation, restoring of coastal wetlands, restoring degraded grasslands, uh, huge amounts of degraded land in the world. Uh, and most of that, if they were restored, you actually get all kinds of benefits. Uh, operate agroecosystems so that they don't leak carbon, but rather accumulate carbon. That increases soil fertility. So there are a lot of arguments for doing these things anyway. Uh, but if you do them collectively, you can make a really big difference. So I think we're actually at a, an interesting moment as a species in relation to biodiversity and the rest of life on Earth. Are we going to recognize that the planet actually works as a combined living and physical system, not just as a physical system? Uh, will we be able to embed human aspiration in nature, uh, which is, in a sense, at the heart of Ed Wilson's idea of half-Earth for nature, uh, which is not literally half the Earth with no people in it, but people where they are there with light impact. Uh, I think these become very real, and I think they are wonderful opportunities for creativity uh, and how we deal with other kinds of humans' aspirations. And so literally two weeks ago, there was a meeting on sustainable infrastructure uh, here in Rio, uh, sponsored by the Inter-American Development Bank and Bay and Dese. Uh, and at one point, the idea of paving the the unpaved portion of the road from Porto Velho to Manas was raised. Uh, and I simply said, well, if you're going to do that, if you really need to do that, make it an elevated highway. And then later in the presentations, I saw these images of the Immigrantes Highway in Sao Paulo. Uh, and basically, that was built with 1 40th one over 40 of the impact just from construction and with zero impact, of course, from spontaneous colonization. Uh, and I think there are many other creative ways to approach development goals uh, in ways that will be much more respectful of biodiversity and the biological systems of the planet. That's another one. So I want to end uh, by telling you uh, about an amazing woman who's actually been to the Amazon when she was in her mid-80s, uh, had gone much earlier to the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, her name was Ruth Patrick, and she died about eight or ten years ago at 105 years old. And basically, you know, when you're 105, people have forgotten who you are. But she nonetheless <laughs> got a really great obituary in the New York Times. And it all goes back to 1947, when she was studying on a contract from the Sun Oil Company, the impacts of the oil company uh, and its activities on streams and rivers in the middle Atlantic of the United States. And she concluded in a major paper that she wrote in 1947 that the number and kinds of species in a river or stream 
tell you not only about the natural physics, geology, chemistry, biology. They also give you a read on human impact in the watershed. So basically, she demonstrated that biodiversity integrates all environmental problems. And so that's Ruth finally being recognized for that by President Clinton with the National Medal of Science. Uh, and we see an echo of it in the next image, which will be my last. Uh, but it basically means that protecting biodiversity is really hard because you have to solve all environmental problems. They all impact on biodiversity. It's not just the direct ones of habitat destruction or hunting or fragmentation. It's also the global nitrogen cycle. Uh, it's the global carbon cycle and climate change. And interestingly enough, you can see this in the very first of the diagrams of the planetary boundaries uh, by Johan Rockström and others. Uh, so some people don't like the idea of boundaries uh, as though there are limits. But basically, what this describes in that center green are the conditions which nurtured the rise of human civilization. And the excursions beyond that are due to human activity. Uh, and so uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the nitrogen cycle. Uh, that's mostly through the use of uh, chemical fertilizers. Uh, overuse of these fertilizers creates dead zones and estuarine waters around the world. A number of them has been doubling every decade for four decades. I mean, it's not a good trend. Uh, and I think, and I told Johan this, and he agrees that uh, in this first version, that he really underestimated the impact of climate change because he wasn't factoring in what climate change is doing to biodiversity. But of course, in the end, the biodiversity loss is by far the greatest. And it's because of Ruth Patrick's principle, basically that biodiversity integrates all these different challenges to the environment. So that, in a sense, lays out the challenge to us. Uh, but we also have the biology of the planet uh, with all the wonderful things it can bring to us, including reducing the amount of climate change to ecosystem restoration. Uh, so that's an excursion uh, uh, around the topic of biodiversity uh, with a lot of glimpses of it here in Brazil probably the most biodiverse country in the planet. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, for the wonderful talk. Always, uh, when uh, when we talk to uh, talk about biodiversity, we end up uh, knowing that we don't know nothing, and uh, uh, normally we don't take questions during presentations like this one. But I'm sure that uh, Tom would like would agree to take one or two questions. Okay. So if you have a question, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, Tom, I can ask in English. 
Um, I was wondering, in your calculation of the impact of ecosystem restoration on drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere, what, how did you figure in um, carbon soil in that, in how much uh, carbon can be stored in the soil? How, how much do we know about this at this point in time, and how much research still has to be done in terms of um, how much ecosystem restoration will actually fix carbon in the soil um, with, instead of just, you know, in the um, above ground plants? So you just, you just put your finger on the, the biggest unknown uh, in all of that. Uh, we know precious little about so soil carbon, and we do know that it's patchily distributed. So it's not like you can take a sample and then, you know, extrapolate, you know, hundreds of kilometers in all directions uh, for the same soil type. Uh, so that's, that's a difficulty. Uh, Although I'd say, if anything, it means we underestimate what it can do. Uh, so it can, it can give us some nice surprises. And it also doesn't happen instantly. Uh, but it does accumulate over time. And, and uh, so I think it's an important part of what we need to pursue. Uh, but a lot of knowledge needs to be generated. I think we can do some of it almost in faith. Uh, but it sure would be nice to get some better numbers on it. Uh, thank you, Professor jo Lovejoy, for, for this talk. And um, I'd like to touch uh, uh, an issue uh, which uh, you somehow touched when you presented that map of Brazil with the different biomes and the, the level of uh, conservation of the different biomes, but also that uh, map shows the, the level of uh, suppression of native vegetation, which is uh, happening at an alarming rate, uh, mostly in the non-forest ecosystems, especially in the Cerrado or in the grasslands in the Pampa or in the savannas in the Cerrado, with all the, the carbon in the soils in these uh, ecosystems. Uh, so uh, when uh, I know we, 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 we should have priorities, uh, but when we uh, have a priority to protect the forests, I, uh, do you agree that uh, business as usual sectors may shift their operations to less uh, sensitive biomes in the minds of, uh, in the, minds of the public? and uh, somehow uh, greenwash their operation in the forest by arms, like in the Amazon. So um, I think, uh, uh, and this is clear, uh, uh, if we look in the data of the forest, of uh, land use conversion in the non-forest ecosystems in Brazil, these are the most uh, threatened, uh, threatened uh, uh, right now in, in Brazil. Well, you're, you're quite right. Um... Uh, the, uh, in one sense, the, the great forest itself has overshadowed them, uh, uh, which doesn't make the great forest any less important. It's, it's that we need to increase the awareness about uh, Cerrado and, and other vegetation types in particular. Uh, and I think a really important part of the solution here is not just you know classic nature protection. It's also Im improving the way agriculture is conducted, and that's this is not a point of just at Brazil. Uh, you know, the United States needs it you know as much, if not more. Um, and the great irony in the, in the United States is is the soils of the grasslands were incredibly rich and deep uh, with roots that would go down like four meters of the grasses. I mean, the, the, the carbon content was amazing. Uh, so uh, I had a really interesting experience about three or four years ago. 
I went at the end of August to Peoria, Illinois. And the taxi driver I took into town from the airport turned out to be a third generation farmer making a little extra money. And he volunteered that he and all his fellow farmers in the region were now doing no-till agriculture. In other words, they weren't plowing up the fields the way they used to every year. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. This is central Illinois. <laughs> uh, and then separately on the same trip, I learned that there had been so much soil erosion that the local government found it worth its while to spend $16 million to dredge it back up out of the river and sell it back to the farmers. Uh, so I just tell that story uh, because it's about sort of self-awareness in an agricultural place where you wouldn't expect it uh, to happen. To really make the point, uh, I think there's a major role here for Embrapa, uh, which I know it needs more funding, clearly needs more funding. Uh, but better ways to do agriculture, you know, the kinds of studies they did uh, maybe three or four years ago now where they determined that cattle production, uh, which is basically southern Amazon and Cerrado, uh, could be doubled on half the land. Uh, so you always have to be careful when you improve productivity because then more people want to do it and you don't necessarily save some land. Uh, but also, I, you know, Brazil has also been a really interesting country experimenting in incentives for farmers. I remember Braulio told me about some really interesting uh, aspects of that some years ago. So uh, I, I think that is an important part of the solution. Uh, we simply can't think about conservation isolated from how the rest of the landscape gets used. É, boa tarde, sou o professor Love Joy. É, você chegou apresentando um slide sobre a liberação de gases de efeito estufa, né, 440 partes por milhão, e a migração de algumas espécies para a região do norte. E se a gente quisesse desacelerar o processo de aumento de temperatura do planeta, é, o que a gente teria que fazer? James Lovelock ele traz num livro, Gaia Alerta Final, que só a nossa presença de seres humanos e todos os seres vivos, a gente libera quase 60% de gases é, efeito estufa na atmosfera. Então, só a nossa presença aqui, a gente acaba liberando muito carbono. Agora, coloca nossos meios de produção. Então, a gente não está desacelerando, mas sim acelerando o processo de aumento de temperatura do planeta. Como você vê essa conclusão que o Lovelock traz para a gente? E de que forma a gente conseguiria estar tá, é, reduzindo esse processo de aumento de temperatura do planeta? So a very valid point. I mean, you, you look at the current trends and you don't, you cannot see in the current trends a happy outcome. Let's just put it that way. Um, the simplest way to do it is, is actually just to put a tax on carbon. Make, make its use more expensive. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to improve, increase everybody's taxes either. You could take those revenues and give them right back uh, as various kinds of refunds. So it could be tax, tax revenue neutral, but it would put that economic signal in place uh, that would encourage the right kind of behavior. Hey, Tom, uh, would you comment uh, on the importance of education for the conservation of biodiversity? Well, this is a really, really important question. And uh, I think it's really important for people just to have exposure to nature at a very young age. 
Uh, it used to happen to many more people just automatically. Uh, and, you know, when we're young, we are almost automatically interested in other living things. Uh, that's sort of been lost. It's, it's partly all our handhelds. Uh, but, you know, we can, we can actually essentially co-opt technology. You don't have to let it just roll over us. So we now have at least some uh, applications in the U.S. which we can use on our little handhelds, which will help us identify trees or identify birds, actually play the bird song, right? Um, so I think it's really important for us uh, to think about just increasing the exposure of young people to nature uh, and then making sure that that opportunity is not lost in later life. And I thought one of the most interesting statistics after uh, the World Trade uh, Center was attacked in 2001 was a major increase in visitation of national parks in the United States. It's like people were recognizing a value uh, in, in nature uh, that they had not been thinking about before. Uh, so it's a, it's a big job. Uh, and I think in addition, the way biology gets taught these days, it's, it's so dominated by molecular biology that the intrinsic fascination of living things uh, doesn't necessarily get covered very much. Uh, so I think we could work on all of those. Professor, a couple of questions, uh, very fast questions. Um, the Amazon rainforest, what does this represent uh, globally in terms of uh, biodiversity? Are we talking about 10, 15, 20, 5 percent of the uh, total number of species we know? And from the n number of species of fishes, trees, whatever, uh, in the Amazon, does this represent uh, what amount of the total that it might be uh, in the in the bioma? Thank you. So you you just asked an almost an impossible question. Um, I mean, we used to think of the tropical forests as holding half of the biological diversity on the planet, uh, but that was a long time ago, and we know a lot more about biological diversity in the oceans and things like that. Uh, one thing one can say for certain is that the Amazon forest has is the single greatest repository of terrestrial biodiversity. Uh, now, I'm going to hazard a guess here uh, that it might be I don't know, as much as 15% of terrestrial biodiversity, but that's a guess. Uh, and it's, you know, it's largely still unexplored. Right? I have a pretty good idea about the trees, although I've got to sort out a lot of those names. Uh, we thought we had a pretty good idea of the birds in the Amazon, but now people are actually looking at or listening when they cross a major river and what looks like the same bird on the other side is singing a different song. It may look like the same thing, but it's like it's speaking Spanish instead of Portuguese, right? Uh, and then when you look at it genetically, it turns out indeed to be quite distinct. So there's going to be a lot more to be discovered uh, of that kind. So Braulio's question is, what gives me hope? Uh, so, so I. 
I actually, one of the things that gives me hope is I see a lot of young people engaged in this and really, you know, caring about it. Uh, whether it's whether it's freshwater biodiversity in the southeast United States, or you know, it's it's some of the wonderful students we get up at Manaus uh, caring about the Amazon forest. Uh, so it's it's that the the younger generation is is actually registering how important it is, and that you know, for an old person like me, <laughs> it's it's going to be left to them to, to do the job. Uh, we've only sort of got to start on it. Boa tarde, professor. Muito obrigado pela sua presença aqui, falando conosco. Obrigado pela oportunidade de estar aqui presente e o senhor está aqui podendo falar com a gente. E eu gostaria de saber se, na opinião do senhor, as empresas, de modo geral, deveriam pagar muito mais pelo crédito do carbono do que elas pagam, porque eu nunca fui à Amazônia para ver com meus próprios olhos como esse trabalho é feito lá. Mas aqui no Rio de Janeiro, eu percebo que só em alguns lugares a mata nativa foi preservada. E isso é muito ruim porque quase 80%, talvez mais, da mata atlântica do Brasil foi desmatada. E nas partes em que eu tive a oportunidade de ver, é, os corredores florestais auxiliam muitos animais, só que são pontos muito isolados. E o crédito de carbono acaba que não visa tanto isso, porque as empresas que fazem esse tipo de serviço beneficiam muito mais elas mesmas do que a natureza, a, o ambiente nativo. Eu queria saber se, na opinião do senhor, é... So let me make two statements in response to that. Uh, uh, one is uh, corporations vary just like people, uh, and some are quite sort of far-seeing and very conscientious, um, and others will get by with as little as they possibly can get by with. Uh, uh, I think that the carbon tax actually is a way to make everybody contribute uh, and reduce the amount of carbon they are in fact uh, using and letting into the environment. Um, and it's... Uh, I mean, virtually any economist who's looked at this problem says that's the easy way to go. Uh, and uh, never easy to suggest a new tax, but if you actually made it revenue neutral and found a way to give it back uh, to people, uh, I think we could have really quick, uh, serious change in a relatively short time. Boa tarde, professor. Eu vou perguntar em português. <laughs> É, a gente está falando do futuro da biodiversidade brasileira, muito voltado ainda à questão da Amazônia, dos ambientes naturais. Mas eu gostaria que o senhor falasse, se pudesse também, um pouco sobre a forma como o Brasil lida com crimes ambientais, pensando um pouco no contexto né, do, do assassinato do Rio Doce, da mineração, pensando na questão do futuro da biodiversidade, quando a gente vive em um país que ainda é, consegue ver um rio ser assassinado e deixar passar impune. Então, se eu pudesse falar um pouco do futuro da biodiversidade brasileira nesse contexto. So I'm a, of course aware of that that terrible accident uh, on the Rio Doce, uh, and it was it was really bad. Uh, it's not just in Brazil though. I mean, every once in a while, one of those happens in the United States too, and usually it turns out. Uh, that there was 
some flaw.